Tara, I'm so glad you're here. I really, Aww. really am so glad you're here. You're one of the coolest women for so many reasons, but I'm so glad that we've just recently gotten to have such a heart to heart and it's so cool to have you here. Thank you for having me. I'm already in love with you. I've spoken to you for like two minutes. I think we're best besties already. We are. We're I'm like going to start stalking you if that's okay. Please. I think I'm at your house. Oh, there she is. <laughs> Open the door. There she is. There she is. Um, all right. So let's talk about your phenomenal career and all of the cool things that you've been doing, um, including, of course, we're going to get to your podcast and all those awesome things. So how does one, how does one human being get to do the cool things that you did? Where did you begin this journey and how did it even happen? That, Cause you didn't just get one cool role. You got like many, many in a row. So there's, there's obviously, it's not like a lucky break. Something's working. Something about you is in alignment. How did all of that come together? That is so true. Like I feel so lucky like some horseshoes some beings like i, I like I, I don't even know how to be grateful enough for being able to be a conduit for so many voices that have touched lives around the world like you know when you wonder oh have i done enough for people and like sometimes i'll just be in meditation and remember people i meet at cons that say i was going to kill myself till i met raven or you know, Teen Titans got me through my parents' divorce. Fairly odd parents. You had our, it was the only time our family laughed together. And it's like, wow, I'm so lucky that whatever I'm doing has brought love to people around the world. Like I, I don't take that lightly at all. So thank you for that. Um, it started in Toronto. I grew up in a small house. No one was in the business except I had a grandfather who was a cantor. That's the closest thing I had. Um, and I knew from five, six years old that I wanted to be singer, dancer, actress. And I begged my parents to get me an agent, which they finally did when I was 13. And at that point, I booked my first uh, animated voiceover role, which was Hello Kitty. Hello Kitty, Storytel Theater is proud to present The Wizard of Paws, just proving that I still got it. Um, and then oh, I did oh a show with Mr. T. <laughs> I did a show with Mr. T. And my first sort of Toronto version of Broadway, I did a theater production. And literally, the rest is history. Like, growing up in Toronto was such a wonderful place to build a resume because there's so much production there. So animation-wise, I got to do Care Bears and My Pit Monsters and Beetlejuice and so many um, co-production with the United States things so that when I came to LA, it wasn't like, who's, who's this girl? Although, for a little while, I was super broke and crying alone in an apartment with eviction notice, not knowing how I was going to survive. The interesting thing was my first job was given to me by a woman named Marsha Goodman, who at the time was head casting and director at Deke Animation. And, you know, in Toronto, I had a very well-rounded career with TV and film in animation equally. And then when I moved out here, I just, it was hard to get established. And I was literally thinking maybe I should just go home. And Marsha Goodman called me and said, do you want to come do the new Gadget Boy and Heather show? And I was like, yes. So she basically saved me twice. She's definitely one of my angels. And then after that, it still took a little time to, to get my feet solidly planted here. And I think it was the time that I booked um, the Powerpuff Girls. Batgirl alongside Mark Hamill and Kevin Conroy and a hundred episodes of 101 Dalmatians that people started going, who is this girl? But it took some time. Like, I don't want people to think I woke up and suddenly I'm here. You know, it takes time. It takes work. I'm 48. I've been in this business since I'm 13. So I've definitely put in the time and also loved every minute of it. Oh my God. It's so cool. It's so cool. And my sister does voiceover and I know what a business that is. And even though she's been auditioning almost every day, she hardly, hardly gets a break. And this isn't a break. This is like, you've had a colossal, incredible ongoing career voicing some of the most famous characters. And that is truly amazing. Like, I hope you pull over to the side of your life sometimes and go, good job, Tara. Like that's, <laughs> that's not something 99.9% .9 of people do, even if they have heart and they're talented, it's just still, there's something about you that's working. Do you have some practice where you sort of um, get centered or your vibration knows how to like turn on? Because I do think that like attracts like, and when people are this successful and I could feel it the second I started to talk to you, which is like, you claim your space and there's something extremely both 
earnest and also powerful about you. What's that? What's that about? Are you doing something or some practice or some reading or some connection meditation? What's going on? Thank there? you. Thank you, sister. Um, you know, I'll, I'm going to break it down as honestly as I can. From when I was little, I knew I was going to be a successful actress. I knew I would be able to support my family. Not that we were like poverty stricken, but we didn't have a lot. I shared a room with my sister till I was 16 in a small house. Um, but I always knew that I would never have to worry about money. And I always knew that I would be a successful actress. And I also knew that I was going to come to Los Angeles pretty young. I knew I wanted to go and do like a movie of the week. And um, around 2006 or whatever, when The Secret came out, someone showed it to me and I'm like, this is, this is, I know this. I do this by nature. I, I have always been a laws of attraction human. It's just who I am by nature. I'm not saying I'm always that. And sometimes I beat myself up when I'm not that and fears rear its ugly head. And so I think we are all a work in progress. I don't know if you saw Defending Your Life. It's my favorite movie of all it's time. It's so good. It's my favorite movie. I think we're here to learn. And I think if we graduate, we get to go on to better places. And I think to think that you're done learning is ridiculous. And I, I, I love learning different ways to keep yourself in positive space, whether that's meditation or reading or just getting centered and silent. For me, of course, it's animals. I'm crazy about animals. I'm crazy for my kids. I could spend 24 seven with my kids and my dogs. I, I really could. Um, and the thing about growing too is learning to say no to situations where you don't feel comfortable, safe, seen, heard, respected. But that takes time. It really takes time to grow and learn and become a centered human. And I'm still learning every single day. I, I love, I love when people give me new information. And sometimes it's the same information worded a bit differently, but it speaks to you. And I think if you're open to that, and also I think if. I, I really think that the most powerful force in this universe is love. I really do. And I think if you're giving love as much as possible and you're sharing that love and you're sharing your gifts and you're making people feel good, it you just get rewarded back for that. And it's not an effort. It's not work. And if someone's an, an asshole or a terrible human being and they're trying to steal your magic, you separate yourself from that person. You don't hate them. You're like, okay, they're on a different journey and they're not going to get to move on where when we get to go to the next place where we're like, we can fly or whatever it is. <laughs> like they're going to have to do it again. Feel sorry for them. But you really have to, I think I'm finding is that if you get older, protect yourself from people that want to steal your magic. Yeah. And it's so, it's so obvious that you are where you are because you said, oh, I just knew from a young age and I was speaking yesterday to, do you know who Byron Katie is? Uh -uh. I was speaking to one of her, um, a woman who works with her really closely. And I said to her, oh, sometimes I feel like I'm, I'm just swimming and swimming and swimming. There's something inside of me that just keeps swimming and I just keep swimming. And she said, are you swimming or is it swimming you? And I feel like, you know, Kabbalistically, the word Kabbalah means to receive. And so one of my holy, holy rabbis who's been on the show a couple of times, he said, you know, there's the law of attraction and then there's the law of reception. And when you are just receiving, when you were a kid, you weren't trying to seek something. It was just a knowing. It was just coming in. It was, I know I'm going to do this. We had busy Phillips here a few weeks ago. And she's like, oh, I just knew since I was a kid, like I'm doing this. And then once people got it, I was like, oh, I'm glad you caught up. Cause that's what I've always <laughs> known. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when we turn on the receiver and we can receive like that, then what you said about love being in an open-hearted vibe, all of that stuff, other people feel that right. And now you're in that law of reception. So you just keep seeing it and seeing it and seeing it. You're not even seeking it. You're just, you're the finder. You know what I mean? It's just, Oh, look what's here. Oh, look what's here. Oh, look what's here. And as you keep seeing it, people go, Oh my God, I think I see what you see. And they just, it, it's just a beautiful thing. So I'm not surprised, but I wanted the audience to hear that because that is something I think we can turn on. We can turn on the radio that we can actually start to receive that. Yeah. Um, so in your career, one of the things that comes up for a lot of people, especially actors, but so many artists, creatives is imposter syndrome when you're dealing with rejection. And for someone who's been as successful as you are, I have no doubt that there's also been times where you heard the word no, or something didn't work out. Um, 
how did you pick yourself up and keep going when those things happen? How do you deal with that rejection and yeah. keep moving? I mean, I, I still deal with that. I often have to audition for parts I've already had. You know, they're like, you know, the new oh Ben 10's coming out. Can you, can you audition? I'm like, you have 15 seasons of me doing this already. Watch it. But the truth is in this business, you have to keep showing up. You have to keep putting yourself out there. And if you don't, someone else will snag your gig. So that's an unfortunate part of the business, as is the blow to the ego when you know you'd kill it. You know, like, this is my part. I would bring this part to life and people would love this so much if you just let me do it. Guess what? Producers don't care. I was casting for a little bit in, in a few Disney pilots and I was amazed to hear like a show creator saying, well, I like that guy because I like the way he said R. I'm like, you just had 15 actors blow your mind. This guy was horrible, but you like how he said R <laughs> or they were a celebrity on a show that they liked or whatever it is. So, you know, acting is, is of course, talent and being able to come off confident even when you're feeling insecure and timing and luck it's very serendipitous everything has to go together which is why i despise um that and get work for hopeful voice actors or they have people pay to audition there's no one in my world that got there because they paid to audition it's a total scam everything has to be um perfectly in place to book something that's going to really put you on the map now with that said i've been sad or hurt or like that was my part many, many times. And you have to move past it because if you carry that disappointment with you into your next audition, that's going to read. So once that's gone, you got to put it away and go, okay, this is going to be it. You know, yesterday, I think I told you when we were just saying hi, I had like audition, job, audition, audition, job, press, like it was all day. And then at the end of my day, I had a few voiceover auditions and I sat in my studio for three hours because there was one in particular that I wanted it to be so perfect. And I wanted to give them three different choices, just like with minute, Miss Minutes or different things where I'm like, this is going to make it stand out. There's thousands of people going for each role. This is going to be it. And guess what? I might not get it, but I can still feel good that I put my best work forward. That's all you have to do. And the other thing I think I was like, okay, if I didn't get that, the person who got it really needed it. The person who got that was meant to bring that character to life. The person who got that was in financial hardships or just went through a breakup or didn't get the last thing they got and this is even better for them I, there's plenty of work i'm happy to share and i think that mentality gets you to do more stuff too because if you're panicked if you're scared if you think i'm not good enough universe goes okay it's true whether you believe in the laws of attraction kabbalah anything that's bringing positive energy and magic into your life whether you believe it or not you're right so try believing that it's you, right? Try believing that's going to be you. Because if that works 50% of the time, you've got a pretty dope life. Mm, that's really powerful. Mm -hmm. For somebody who wants to do voiceover, because there are so many people who are like, that would be so fun. And they don't really understand necessarily like, what does it take? Or what would you say is your advice when, when you are wanting to break through and you're wanting to stand out? When you say like, try to do your best work and all of that from, from listening to people. Cause I'm sure people have sent you reels or you've listened to people's stuff every day. What do you every think day. makes, makes a difference? What do you think people need to know to break through? First of all, they need to know that it's very hard. It's not impossible, but it's very hard. It can't be a side gig. It can't be, let me try this or I have an unusual voice. People tell me I should do a voiceover. I'm sorry. Do you have any acting experience? It's not about sounding crazy. It is about bringing to life characters with your voice, where if you're doing an on-camera job, you know that there's a person in front of you, a building that's falling down, a boat, whatever it is. If you're doing voiceover, you have to portray the action with just your voice. And it's an art and it's a skill form and it takes many, many years to make awesome. Although you can book something at a young age, you could book something and be a standout. I always know when someone new in the studio is gonna be a star or not, because you have to have that extra something, you just do. I was doing a Rugrats and I walked out and one of the artists said, look at this. And he drew baby Dill, like getting high and doing some weird, funny, hilarious stuff. And he drew it in five seconds and he gave it to me and he signed it. I'm like, Oh my God, thank you. And how do you do that? And he said, how do you do what you do? And I said, okay, okay. Like that's, that's this gift. So if, if you have this gift, 
of course, go for it. Don't give up. There's always room for good people, but just know it's a journey and you got to put your work in. You got to start out with acting classes, scene study, singing lessons. It's a muscle. You got to learn how to protect it, how to use it, how to expand it, all the different places it can go. I always tell people to take improv, Second City, Groundlings, anything, because that makes you feel more confident in anything you do to be able to jump into a situation, say, say something crazy, funny, hilarious or whatever. Um, know all the different characters you do. And after those steps, then you take a voiceover class with someone who's reputable, preferably someone who casts, because then they get to know you and say, oh, I just read Marcy for that. Let's put her on the show. Um, then you make a demo, not till then, because demos can be really expensive. There's an ugly side of the business that likes to take advantage of hopefuls. I see it every day. I see it every day. And when I go to cons and I see people that, you know, want it so badly, and spend thousands and thousands of dollars to make these demo tapes or uh, join websites that promise them work. It's heartbreaking because no, no one, I can't promise you work. Nobody can promise you work. It's just not how it works. So after you do a demo, then you go to an agency. Hopefully uh, the best way is a friend recommendation. Otherwise it's cold delivery, which is more challenging. Um, and always like i said put your best foot forward really care about what you're doing i never phone it in it's been a long time and i still don't phone it in you have to care about everything you do that's really really generous of you to give all of that great advice and the next question to piggyback on that is let's say you really do want it and along the way you're trying to figure out how much is me sort of being foolish and continuing on especially when there's people who might say, great, oh yeah, that's so good. And it's, you're saying maybe cruel to do to someone who's hopeful to say, oh yeah, yeah, like to give people false hope. Where do you know when it's false hope or when you just haven't stuck it out long enough, right? Because that's a whole other side is where people just give up really often on things that get hard. What, what, what would be a good litmus test to know, like if you actually have the chops for something or you don't? It's a great question because I can <laughs> reference my good friend, Brad Norman, who's a brilliant, brilliant actor. He came from Chicago, Second City, a billion commercials. It took him 200 animation auditions to book Bullwinkle. And he was my Bullwinkle for Rocky and Bullwinkle, 200. So I don't know that there's an accurate litmus test. I don't know that there's a, an expiration date. If you really love it and you really want to do it, um, and you've had some feedback that's not from uh, someone that's trying to take advantage of you. Um, also, you know, we live in a wonderful time where you can make your own content and put your own stuff out there. People that are becoming celebrities on TikTok, Instagram, it's not the worst idea to see if you have it, to see if you got what it takes. Even that success, though, doesn't necessarily guarantee you commercial, real world success. So it's kind of a crapshoot. There, there's no real answer to that. Um, but I would say if it's in you and you feel like this, this is what mm -hmm. I'm here to do, you got to keep trying. If it means you can't pay your bills, <laughs> then do what you have to do to take care of yourself and your family. But maybe don't give up on that dream because you never know. 200 auditions, 200. Yeah. You just never know. It's a tough question. It really is. Because like I said, I hate people taking advantage of hopefuls when in fact, you know, it's, it's, yeah. you don't, you don't have that special. There's something special you need to have to really stand out. You can't just be good in voiceover. You have to be extraordinary. Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. I always say that everyone has Michael Jordan talent at something, but not everyone has Michael Jordan talent. Like not everyone has the talent of becoming the greatest of all time but maybe on the way to it, they realize, oh, I'm a good trainer or I'm going to go be Phil Jackson. I'm going to be the best coach or I'm going to wind right. up being the best on the court photographer. But my love of basketball and playing basketball is what led me there. So I love that idea of just keep following it. But then yeah. I think be open to where the universe is saying yes. Like what is the feedback, right? Um, when you have gotten the opportunities, you've had so many of these beautiful roles is there a favorite one? And is there a favorite moment where you were in the booth and you were like, 
I can't believe I'm pinching myself. I can't believe this. Is <laughs> There's been so many. I, I always say that my very favorite, like, okay, I could die tomorrow. <laughs> life moment was um, when I booked the little mermaid too, because I was such a fan of the original, like um, my father passed away a couple years ago and literally the poster was still hanging in my childhood bedroom from the little mermaid. And I used to run around doing impressions of her. And when I booked the role of her daughter and got to sing in the studio with Joey Benson, first of all, I shook her hand and I burst into tears. She's like, are you okay? I'm like, I've just loved you for so long. <laughs> and like to sing with her was like dream come true. And they drew my face on the animation. Like it was like, wow, that was magic moment. Thank you for this. But then after that. That is pretty beyond words. Yeah, uh, it, it was amazing. Um, but also playing that girl in between Mark Hamill and Kevin Conroy, like I would pinch myself all the time. As a kid, um, my dad had a World War II museum. He had the first edition of like every comic. So I knew the world of Batman. So to be thrust into that world on such a big level was pretty incredible. And then Powerpuff Girls, so much fun. We have this show where we're empowering young girls and friends of young girls and having so much fun. Animation is a very fun world. There, You'd be hard pressed to find a day when you're not pinching yourself. Um, and I remember also like, um, you know, as a kid, I loved the Flintstones. So, you know, one gig, I, I can't even remember what it's for, but I got to play Pebbles. And even looking at the script and seeing Pebbles, I'm like, oh, that's fun. You know, it's it's always fun. It's, I mean, there are moments where things can be ta vocally taxing or you have a director that doesn't quite get it. But for the most part, animation is so fun that I pinch myself on a daily basis. Mm, so good um, because I have three daughters um we listen to you all the time in fact there was a period of time where the only thing that was in my car no joke was the little mermaid 2 Aww. um and the powerpuff girls oh. and uh and the my little pony series yeah. and i never would have thought that they all had something in common that would mean that we'd have this conversation and I was literally listening to you on repeat for hours and hours and hours in the car Aww. when they were watching those things. Um, but you're so, so talented and you're also so humble. Like I, um, we had Yardley Smith on the show a couple of years back and there's a lot of humility in being a voiceover actor because you're working just as hard, if not harder than actors, as you said, you have to convey so much of what's going on. And just like how doctors get a lot of credit and nurses don't and nurses are there 92% of the time. Oh doctors. my God. I feel like, you know, she said something about how the Simpsons cast would like go on the red carpet and like, nobody wants to even talk to them. And like, they are so talented. It's beyond. And it's almost like there's a different um, amount of respect that they're given. And I hear the work you're doing and I, and it's not just, it's not just your voice, you're acting, you're singing, you're, and years and years and years of you pouring in to kids, to adults, to all of us. I think that there must be a lot of humility that goes along with that. And I just wonder how does that, how does that feel being in LA and being a very successful working actor and not necessarily having the same recognition? I mean, literally you're not recognized on the street as often as somebody else. Um, how does that feel? Well, she's she's right and you're right. And I don't really know why that is, but Hollywood does have a way of not really appreciating their voice actors. We're always back to one, meaning we always go back to scale. Scale is like a sag daily rate. You know, it's like, wow. it's, it's not nothing to poo poo. It's like, okay, yeah, you're yeah, getting yeah. Eight, $800 to sit in the studio. The studio can be making a billion, but you're gonna make 800 today. And so, after a while in on camera, you get to say, I'm not gonna do this movie for less than a million dollars. Voiceover people don't have that luxury. So and interesting, fascinating. Yeah, yeah, I think the reason there are stars in animation is because of the fans. So grateful that there are ways to look up your favorite voice actor. Um, Twitter, I, you know, I have almost half a million Twitter followers to be able to connect with the fans who show love all the time. I don't know that my predecessors know, knew how beloved they were. Thank yeah. God for the fans fighting for their favorite voice actors, because I think Hollywood's like, oh, she won't do it for double scale. Let's put out a casting call. Oh, thanks. So I helped. Oh my God. It was a collaborative Bur process yeah. to, to create this character that now you're selling billions of dollars in backpacks and you're going to replace me because I don't want to do it for double scale. Like, there's a really big disconnect and often we get replaced by 
you know, so-and-so from the office or and I don't have a problem with big A-list subjects because they see what everyone can do and they're like this is not my art form it's like asking a tap dancer if they ballet not everybody does so um, it's unfortunate um, but I do think the humility in the voice actor also comes from it doesn't matter what you look like you get paid to bring these characters to life you're surrounded by the most gifted individuals that blow my mind every day with their versatility, creativity, authenticity, organic ability to come up with something new. Like it's it's astounding that you can be in this business this long and still come up with a voice you've never heard coming out of your head, right? Like it's like where did that where did that come from? Oh, it's um, unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah, you're you know, I worked with Stan Lee on Spider-Man. Oh he was like in his 90s and he was in such great shape. And I said, "What what is your secret?" And he said, "Do what you love and don't retire." Do what you love. And I said, how does it feel that your brain came up with so many iconic characters? It's <laughs> amazing. And he said, I always had a good team. And I think that's for voiceover too. It's a team sport as opposed to on camera where people can be individualistic or catty. Um, we all like genuinely love each other. We're a very, very strong community. It's interesting you were saying before about the celebrity part, because my husband's always said this and it, it, it started to, to really ring true to me that he didn't understand why they would cast celebrity voices in movies because he said he actually thought it was distracting. Like he would rather it be a voiceover actor than somebody who you know from a role who you've watched because then you see this little whatever moose in the middle of this movie but you're distracted thinking about whatever but you're like so, wait that's brad pitt <laughs> right. right right so it's like what well, he always says why don't they just keep giving it to the voiceover actors who know how to do this and anyways yeah. i think that that's really true um true. so you have all these things going on and still you decided to do a podcast um <laughs> what made you want to start the ship it show uh you know there is such a big part of fandom that gets ignored, which is the cosplayers. And when you start going to Comic Cons, you realize how integral it is to their lives. These people spend mm -hmm. a year saving money to be ready for They work with 3D printers or they save up their money to buy from someone else. And there's so much effort that goes into cosplaying. And the community is this beautiful community where in their regular lives, they might be shy or quiet or have no confidence. But once, once they suit up as Batgirl, they're like, mm. uh, you know, like untouchable. And cosplay sees no color, no age, no body size. It is the most inclusive world ever, and it's never been celebrated. So we initially pitched the idea of um, of celebrating what what people love in fandom, which is imagining. Um, characters together in relationship. And the most famous ship, or they say the most canon ship, is BB Ray, which is Beast Boy and Raven, which is myself and Greg Sipes. And we are in love in real life. We're like the best, best of friends. We just adore each other. And so who better than to do a show celebrating the idea of fictional characters being in love and all that includes, which is the actors that bring it to life, the artists that draw it, the directors that work on it, and the fans that spend their lives getting ready to dress up as these characters. I've met couples at grocery stores who are, um, you know, ha uh, uh, Harley and Joker. You know, her hair is two different colors all the time. The, the boyfriend's green hair all the time. And I walk by and she's like, oh my God, oh my God. And it's like, why aren't they celebrated? They're basically the most adorable, often real good looking people <laughs> who get made fun of because they like to dress as these characters. Why? So we love the idea so of celebrating them. And it's been so much fun. And COVID was the best time to launch it because everyone's home anyway. And so many of these cosplayers have built their new um, businesses by being at home, creating content, creating these costumes. A lot of them hand paint. I don't know if you've seen these, these mostly girls I've seen who can paint themselves to make it look like they're wearing full regalia. It's like, unbelievable what they can do it's so talented and also it these shows inspire music art poetry stories like all that is not being celebrated anywhere so it's really um was really spawned in a way to um give back to the fans that give so much to us but it's it's turned out to be an insane amount of fun we have 
we actually are overdue for an episode, but we have so much fun. As you know, it's work. It's work. <laughs> you know, it's incredible, and it's so loving and 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 giving that you are making such a big space for the people who you said just a few minutes ago are really there for you. You know, the yeah. family. And I feel like so often there's this thing in our culture where the people who are anointed and celebrated are like sort of wanting to be away from the people who love them so much. And I recently had Matthew McConaughey on the podcast and I was so touched at how much he wants to connect with people directly. And he likes to teach classes at University of Austin and he likes to be out there. And, and he said, he spends an extra half hour after the episode saying, how do I do more of this? Like when this is just so cool that you get to talk directly to people and you don't have to be up there on a screen, like light years away from a human who you're working, telling a story to touch that person. And you're, you're very um, unusual, Tara, that you like got that and want to like lean in to those people and celebrate all that is their creativity. And I think that that's so cool. Thank you. I wish that more people would, were to do that because it takes the ego away from it too. It's like you then make yourself just part of this beautiful like symphony rather than this is about me and therefore I need to sort of be distanced from you. And I don't know what all that is about, but it's very- I, I don't either. It's funny. I always knew like the girl painting my toes, which I can't do myself, is just as important as the director. Like why treat someone crappy because they don't have a title uh, in the entertainment business. And like you said before, nurses, holy crap, they're way more heroes than I am. I mean, if you've ever been in a situation where you are relying on a nurse 100%. to save your life, you realize how important. And teachers, hello, like these people that are molding brains and childhoods and inspiring, like there are so many worlds of heroes on this planet that all should be celebrated equally. Unless you're a dick, then we don't want to celebrate you. You got to be a good human. You just do. And yeah. you got to be gr grateful and give back. And, you know, I don't have a problem with people that don't necessarily want to be in the spotlight, but everyone should be treated with respect and kindness. It's always. so true. I took a bunch of classes at the UCLA Mindful Awareness Center. And there was one class where the teacher gave us all a strawberry and she's like, hold the strawberry in your hand. And now we're going to eat it. But before you eat it, I want you to think about how everything in the world is in the strawberry, like the rain and the wind. And I want you to think about the truck driver who left his family for eight hours to take this to the grocery store. And then the sweet people who took it off the truck and put it on the shelf. And then all the people who had worked that land day in and day out, like we're completely connected and interconnected with everyone and everything. And we forget that so easily. We forget how, if one of those things was not there, things would be very different and they just wouldn't work. So I love that you brought that perspective. Um, I just was told by my producer that you, they announced that Pretty Hard Cases is going to be available um, mm -hmm. on IMDb TV. Tell us a little bit about that. First of all, everybody wants to play the bad guy. So it was so much fun. If, if Harley Quinn was a mom, that's Tiggy. And um, I remember auditioning for this role and thinking this would be so much fun to play because my on-camera world has been primarily you know, cute teacher on Big Time Rush or fun mom, or, um, things you can really sink your teeth into. Yeah. And this character has so much depth and gets to explore so many different emotional areas in her life in this world. And it was such a gift to, to be able to play her. Um, the writers, producers are all very strong, independent women who themselves have pulled themselves from under the thumb of misogyny, as is this character. And I, I, when I found out I booked it, I was like, oh, I need that so bad right now. And I booked it before the pandemic, but because of the pandemic, I got to bring my kids. So we all went to Canada to shoot the, to shoot the show. And my younger son was in it with me. And wow. like every single day was a gift on this show. I remember when we wrapped, I was crying and saying thank you to the crew who I wouldn't recognize in real life because everybody was masked. But it still was this amazing sort of, social experiment where mm. I got to connect with people from their vibe without even knowing what their faces looked like most of the time. And it was this synergy of people really being there for each other to shoot this extremely well-written show. It's, it's, a, it's 
it's so well written. And I think because there are so many kick ass women behind it, that translates. And I'm excited that it's coming to the States. People are going to be like, um, who is this Tara? It's completely different from anything I've ever done. I'm just going to ask you because my producer, Emma, is so great. And she pulls together lots of things that maybe not everybody knows about someone. And mm. um, given the fact that you and I are both Jewish, and I think right now it's such a good time for people, whoever you are, whatever you are, to be openly proud of who you are. So I, I heard that you had worked in Yiddish theater mm -hmm. and not everybody even knows what Yiddish is, even though people use words that are Yiddish all the time. Um, but what, what about that? What about being Jewish or having worked in Yiddish theater, or the Toronto Jewish theater? What about that affects you as a person, as a mom, as an actor? How does any of that play a role in your life? Well, I, um, my mom was first generation Russian Jew and her mom forced her like five sisters and mom on a boat while their Jews were being chased away in pogroms and her mom generation. And um, I grew up with a lot of tradition, not necessarily like uh, orthodox, but tradition, which I love. I love tradition in all cultures that bring people together that yeah, have, beautiful. Um, yeah. And so um, we grew up very Jewish. I was in a Hebrew school uh, from the age of kindergarten till fourth grade. And I was fluent. I could speak Hebrew fluently and I loved it so much. And I also thought when I was little that when you get old, like 30, you automatically know Yiddish because all of my, <laughs> all, all my mishpacha spoke Yiddish and it's like the most hilarious language. It's, it's a best. hilarious language. Um, and right before I booked the professional gigs, I booked a job in the Yiddish theater and I had to learn the lines phonetically because I did not know Yiddish and after, except from what I heard from my parents. And then after the show, the old bubbas would come back and talk to me in Yiddish. I'm like, I, I didn't really know what they were saying, but it was a beautiful, beautiful experience. Um, you know, when I was 16, I went on the March of the Living and I got to um, see firsthand the concentration camps and also the amount of anti-Semitism that unfortunately still lingers in Poland. We had stones thrown at our bus and a swastika painted on it. And it, it was not all that. There were some beautiful moments. You know, we were singing in a in a shul that was one of two that was left after explosions. And this old guy walked by crying and he was um, not Jewish, Polish citizen. And someone translated that he said, it's been so long since the Jews have been here and it's good to see them back. And I was like, oh my God. Um, and I think watching in my group, there were 6,000 kids from all over the world marching from Birkenau to Auschwitz. And you see like, wow, this is a, people who've been hated for a very long time for really no reason. And to see everyone strong and surviving. And I sang on top of a crematorium that the Jews um, blew up after they were rescued. And Elie Wiesel spoke. And right before I sang, it was raining and, and uh, the sun came out and Ellie started to cry. And he said, if, I was, if, I, if you were here when I was a child, you'd all be dead. You'd all be dead. And I think it's just in me to be very proud of my heritage and my family and people who haven't made it, who survived to keep this very old um, tradition and, and religion going. And, and I think any religion that inspires you to be a better person, if it's not uh, in any way hurting people, like I don't really understand bullying at all. Like it's a very big problem for me, anti-Semitism. Um, racism, anti-LGBTQ. I don't, I, my brain doesn't comprehend it at all. But I do feel like Jewish people, for whatever reason, get a lot of hate. And I, I don't understand it. I really don't. So I feel protective of my people. And I'm not afraid to say I'm, that I'm Jewish. And, um, you know, I remember I was when I was working on Chowder, she was a character that was inspired by Yiddish. And I was the only Jew in the room. So often I'd give them ideas of how to like, you know, there's like a Yiddish flip for things like this is the way you put your clothes on. Like, you know, it was, like, <laughs> you know, it was so much fun. So, um, yeah, it, it's important to me. It's important to me. But in, in a way of inclusivity, in a way that I, I have satyrs in my house that one year I had 70 people in my backyard. And they weren't all Jewish and teaching them culture and traditions. And I had arts and crafts for people to make their own little, you know, dreidels or whatever it was. Like, I always love doing things that bring people together. And that's really important to me. Mm -hmm. You know, I recently uh, was um, raising money for an organization called Children of Peace after the last terrible 
things that went on in Palestine and Israel. And there's an organization that are the ones that bring Palestinian Israels together. And there are beautiful, beautiful organizations that are doing this, that understand that if you lined up 10 people, you would not be able to tell who they worship. We're all humans. Like you said before, we're all one. And even doing that, by the way, I got some hate. This is an organization that has saved 400,000 children. They don't see religion. They help they help bring everyone together through the arts and through all sorts of programs. And it's a beautiful org. Um, I think I raised like 10 grand for them in one weekend. And I still got hatred for it because I'm Jewish. I, I, I'll never understand it, but I'm happy I don't understand it because I wouldn't want to be someone that lives with that much hate for no reason. I just wouldn't. No. And that's so giving of you to share. And that story just brought tears to my eyes, what you shared yeah. about singing on the roof of a crematorium in a concentration camp and Ellie Wiesel is standing there. I mean, what a powerful, <laughs> incredible moment. Um, and I think what people don't understand, and, and you said it right, I mean, you it's, it's about inclusivity. And um, I don't think everybody knows this, but first of all, out of the seven and a half billion plus people in the world, only 14 and a half million people in the whole world are Jewish. 14 and a half million in the entire world. We are like one of the smallest groups of people. Um, and we don't believe that if you're not Jewish, that you're bad or wrong or going to some hell. We don't have that. We're no. like, that's why Jews are not, we're not huge because we don't believe that you need to be Jewish or that you need to convert. So having 70 people at a Seder is like amazing. Like I was yeah. never raised to believe that somebody else is bad or it's like, no, like we're, we're, we're this because it's like, this is who we are. We're a people, right? Yeah. And, um, and we believe that this, this thing that is, was, always will be he, she, it, whatever you want to call it, this God is for all of us. And we all get to be loved by and connect to this creator, this energy period, end of story. And I don't think people know that um, because that's something that you don't necessarily assume goes along with a religion. You think a religion means that we think we're right and you're wrong and we need to go. It's just yeah. fascinating. Um, but it's yeah. beautiful for you to share. And um, I'm very delicate about how often I, I, I bring it up or, or mention it, but it is a part of who I am, you know, and, and like you said, whatever a person is, you know, whether you're at what what race what gender what religion what sexuality like people should just be able to be loved unconditionally for who they are and and you and I want that for everyone and so it's heartbreaking to see that what's been going on I often say we live in an empathy deficit and I've just seen over the last few years especially just just how much better we could do we could do so of course. much. Better. Of course so, we could. If yes. everyone just decided we're only going to put love into this universe. Yeah. I mean, can you imagine if, if suddenly there was no money spent on hatred, if there was no money spent on wars and all money went into feeding everyone that doesn't have food, into housing people that don't have homes, into curing diseases. What a kick ass planet this would be. Yeah. But I don't know. We're not there yet. Yeah, we're not there yet, but no. I think what you started with um, is a is a is sort of the place to end and to start, which is kind of opening your heart. And you said being in that vibration of love, and 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 as we the two of us were saying, like you can plug into that. That's who you are. You don't have to seek it. It is you, right? We are, we are that um, beauty and that energy. So. So now I want you to tell everybody, since they all just fell in love with you, where they can follow you, where mm -hmm. they can find you, where they can listen to the podcast, all those things. Um, thank you, my love. Um, so everywhere, I'm just at Tara Strong. So on Instagram, Twitter, I have a pro page on Facebook, Tara Strong. And our podcast is The Ship It Show, which you can find wherever you find your local podcasts. And you can watch them on YouTube. You can um, participate in the live shows that we have every Tuesday, we Greg and I pop on and say hi to people, and sometimes we have live shows and bring fans on. It's it's been a lot of fun. That's awesome. Well, you're just really one of the easiest people to talk to and to like, Aww. and it's so freaking cool to meet you because I've been watching you and listening to you for so long. So thank you for being here. What mm -hmm. a fun way to spend this afternoon. 